Welcome to this year's Columbia Arbitration Day under the title We Thinking International Arbitration Towards Transformation and Reform. On behalf of Columbia's International Arbitration Association and the organizing committee of this conference, we would like you to join us for a minute of solidarity with the people of Ukraine before we start with our program. It is with a heavy heart that we make this statement. Many of us dearly remember discussing and exchanging views with fellow Ukrainian practitioners and conferences just like this for the Kiev Arbitration Days. And many of us have friends and family who found themselves in the middle of a war by surprise. As part of the international arbitration community, we do not want to remain silent to these atrocities, but condemn the invasion from the Russian government. We want to open our hearts to all the innocent victims of this unprovoked war. Also, we want to remember the victims of conflicts that left the spotlight of media, but are still raging. Today, our unwavering commitment to developing and, pro and promoting the rule of law, international law, and peaceful conflict resolution takes on even more significance. With this, I want to give the stage to Gabriele kaufmann kula who delivers the keynote on globalization and how to maintain international arbitration's legitimacy. As one of the top arbitration practitioners and Professor Marita of the University of Geneva Law School, she needs no further introduction. Professor kaufmann kula the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, let me say that I wholeheartedly share in the message of solidarity and support for the, for the Ukrainian people in this horrific tragedy. Then I would like to thank the student organizers for this invitation to Columbia Arbitration Day. I'm happy to be in New York today, even though is only virtually. I, I do hope it will soon again be possible to be there in person, but uh, right now we are certainly privileged to, to have this communication means. Uh, the organizers have asked me to speak about globalization and how to maintain the legitimacy of international arbitration. When I started to think about the topic, it looked like a huge subject was multiple facets. And so I looked for an angle of attack, something, uh, one aspect of globalization that may improve uh, the legitimacy of international arbitration. And it struck me that that facet could well be uh, diversity. I would like to reflect on this topic with you this morning in three parts. First, I would like to explore uh, how, whether and how diversity can improve legitimacy. Then I would like to review the current state of diversity and then look at, in the third part, look at ways to enhance diversity. But before I go into these three part analysis, I must give some explanation about uh, re the relevant concept. And I would like to start with uh, diversity. That term, of course, is familiar. It covers a broad range of ways in which uh, people identify. It, it includes gender, age, nationality, origin, race, ethnicity, religion, culture, disabilities, sexual orientation and socioeconomic status. Speaking of globalization, uh, nat naturally the focus will be on geographical or regional diversity and that I use this term as a 
loose proxy for race, ethnicity, uh, legal system, culture, tradition, and particularly relevant in investor state uh, dispute settlement, the level of development of a state. I will not speak today of gender diversity, uh, which is the other most relevant uh, diversity component in international dispute settlement. I will not speak uh, about it, not because it is not important, but because it matters less in the context of globalization and because also it is more advanced uh, nowadays than regional diversity. The next concept uh, that requires clarification is globalization. We all know what globalization is. International arbitration as we know it today is, is a product of globalization, of cross-border trade and investment, of development of transportation communication means of increased mobility. As such, it is actually inherently diverse uh, because of its international or transnational dimension and because of the presence of actors from different jurisdictions. So the question is not really whether there is diversity, but uh, rather whether there is sufficient diversity and whether there's a right mix of diversity for a given dispute and in the arbitration industry uh, in general. If we watch the world today, uh, we must admit that we, have, we are past the peak of globalization. With the financial uh, crisis uh, of 2008, uh, nationalism, protectionism, sometimes populism, populism have risen again and the pandemic has further fragmented the planet and the war in Ukraine uh, brings us back to 19th century imperialism. At the same time, the almost global support for uh, Ukraine these days and in a completely different uh, level, on a completely different level, but equally uh, illustrative, the rapid global spread of the coronavirus have reminded us how interconnected the world is. And in such a world, at the same time interconnected, but in parts also torn apart, uh, legitimate in international dispute settlement is more needed than ever. The last concept that needs explanation is uh, certainly international arbitration. Moving forward, I will put the emphasis on investor state arbitration because this is where legitimacy is uh, most heavily challenged. Not that commercial arbitration is entirely spared, but the level of criticism is not comparable. Uh, this, this, is a, that's, this is understandable. Investment arbitration uh, has a, heavy, a, a strong component of inter, uh, public interest. Uh, investment arbitrators rule on it, the international responsibility of states. And the result of investment arbitration can impact the fiscal resources of a state and thereby a state's population. Having now uh, given uh, the setting this, having set the scene by, by clarifying the concepts, uh, we can now enter the three step analysis. The first step being whether and how diversity can improve legitimacy. There are a number of uh, reasons why diversity matters in international dispute settlement. One is that the need for diversity is recognized in most circles as a value, uh, as a matter of justice towards underrepresented groups. I don't think that requires a long explanation, at least not in front of this audience. Another reason 
is that diversity is set uh, to improve the quality of the surgeons. Now, so far, there's no clear scientific empirical evidence that diversity improves the quality of outcomes in international dispute settlement, uh, which in any event is, is difficult to measure uh, methodologically. But one would, at least as a matter of common sense, expect that di a diverse body takes into account different viewpoints and thereby makes better informed decisions. More important for our purposes is that diversity uh, increases the, the legitimacy of the dispute resolution methods. Uh, that rationale of is, is important for any dispute resolution mechanism, but it is particularly relevant for investment arbitration where the main criticism of the current system is that uh, it lacks legitimacy. Uh, that criticism targets arbitrators, who they are, how they, are, uh, how they uh, get appointed, and also their perceived lack of independence and impartiality. Uh, that criticism goes to legitimacy, not as a legal notion. Legitimacy in international law arises from the consent of the state, and the consent have given Give, the states have given that consent to this system, but it uh, arises more as a sociological notion. It designates the acceptance of the exercise of authority by those affected by it, who voluntarily comply with the decisions, irrespective of their content, and not because they are forced, but because they recognize the authority as justified, or if you prefer, as legitimate. And viewed from this angle, it seems obvious that an adjudicatory body that provides fair representation or a good reflection of those who may be affected by its decisions stands a better chance of being accepted as legitimate. Studies of uh, perception of domestic courts, especially in uh, the US, show that diversity can be a powerful tool to promote uh, the public's confidence in the fairness of the, ad, of the judiciary. So now having established that diversity can improve legitimacy, let's, let's look into the current state of diversity in international dispute settlement. That this is my second part. And as I circumscribed earlier, it will focus on regional diversity and investment arbitration. Now, what does uh, the empirical data show? I didn't want to... Uh, flood you and drown you in uh, statistics. But I, so I have selected just two, uh, two uh, slides with uh, empirical data that hopefully will be enlightening. Can I ask Simon to show the first slide? Yes. Um, here you show and you look at the bottom where it says all non-Western regions you say that you see that there are uh, in total 26 percent of non-western arbitrators appointed uh, the classification of the regions may be uh, outdated but but the, the the chart does capture the essence of geographical or regional diversity and these figures include all investor state arbitration from the start of this uh, dispute resolution mechanism. And I've asked myself, because I, uh, that will probably be more interesting, is to see whether there's an evolution over time. And so I asked my colleague, Daniel Bain, who has uh, a database on investment arbitration that is extremely uh, detailed to put together some figures that show on the second street uh, slide. Simon, can I ask you? Not the second one. Yes, good. The second one. 
And so the question is really how has regional diversity fared in investment arbitration over the years? And the, um, the answer is unfortunately not well, as this compilation shows, uh, strangely enough, the regional diversity was better in the early days of investment arbitration than it is today, uh, 32%, and uh, it has stagnated at 25-26% uh, in the last two decades. I have no explanation for this. Uh, I could, can only guess that it may be linked to the professionalization of arbitrator activity and that more professional arbitrators who are more often appointed are, uh, are from the West. Uh, that percentage, Simon, you can, uh, you can stop sh uh, screen sharing. Thank you. Uh, the, the percentage of one fourth of non Western arbitrators must be placed in context of the regional spread of the disputing parties in investor state arbitration. The, claim, the most frequent claimant nationalities are US, UK, the Netherlands, and German, Germany, and Spain. So these are all Western. Uh, region. All time most frequent respondents are Argentina, Venezuela, Spain, and Egypt, all non Western, uh, but for Spain. A more granular analysis in, uh, of the numbers in recent years uh, would show some diversification. Uh, of nationalities of claimants and respondents as businesses from emerging economies invest uh, increasingly abroad and developed countries are more and more targets of uh, investor claims. But even taking these uh, changes uh, into account, the disconnect between those who make the decisions and those who are at the receiving end of the decisions is it remains striking. What, what are the causes of the current state? Um, well, historic underrepresentation, of course, uh, maybe also an unconscious biases, insufficient opportunities for new entrants from uh, underrepresented regions, and that is linked to the limited information that is available on less visible candidates. And also, there must be uh, what must also play a role is risk aversion of those who make the appointments to first time arbitrators compared with an overvaluation of prior experience. And that leads me now to my third part. How can regional diversity uh, be improved and thereby how can legitimacy be improved? It is not my idea now to draw up a long inventory of measures uh, that would be tedious and others have done this. Uh, let me just make uh, three comments. First, after this rather, this rather sobering data, the good news is that the awareness of the need for regional diversity and the existence of a deficit in this respect is growing. There's a gradual change in, uh, a gradual shift in mentalities making its way. Uh, to what extent this awareness is accompanied by a consciousness of unconscious biases, that is open. But it seems clear that the awareness and some consciousness is, is growing in most societies and, and, of course, also in the international dispute settlement community. The second comment is that as a consequence of this growing awareness of the need of regional diversity, 
we are witnessing a number of initiatives by states. Uh, states take initiatives in investment treaties. For instance, the uh, EU or regional organizations of states, if you prefer, uh, the EU treaties uh, provide for court-like investor state, uh, court-like investor state dispute settlement that builds in nationality requirements that are tied to the contracting states and yet ensures uh, neutrality and impartiality. Um, other states' initiatives are discussed in the UNSECRETAL Working Group 3 on uh, the reform of ISDS, where the lack of diversity has been identified as a major concern that needs to be remedied. Now, how could the, the reforms increase diversity? Uh, one reason for the slow progress is the appointment of arbitrators by parties and council, which tends to perpetuate the pool of usual suspects chosen for their prior uh, track records as, as arbitrators. So some states, probably not all, might well change this uh, in favor of a point by, by uh, arbitral institutions uh, of all arbitrators, uh, the arbitral institutions record outperforms that of council or, or parties, if you prefer. Another proposal is for parties to select arbitrators from a list or a roster of, pre uh, of arbitrators pre-screened for uh, diversity. And still another uh, proposal is the creation of a multilateral investment court or an appellate mechanism that, uh, that whose composition would uh, need to meet certain diversity targets. Third, now leaving aside state initiatives, uh, there are various actors in the field who have started taking uh, action to promote regional diversity. First and foremost, uh, the arbitral institutions in appointing arbitrators and uh, staff also uh, through staffing their internal need, uh, bodies. Uh, other organizations have launched various projects and furtherance of diversity. Uh, for instance, the equal, what, uh, the racial equality for uh, arbitration lawyers initiatives or real. Uh, there are projects giving access to information to uh, less visible uh, arbitrators from uh, that is arbitrators from underrepresented groups. For instance, the list of African arbitrators. Uh, published by the African Arbitration Association. There are also large companies that start demanding diversity from their outside council, both in the composition of uh, council teams and in the constitution of the lists of candidates for arbitrator appointment. Third party funders can also play a diversity enhancing role. Uh, Burford Capital, for instance, has set up a fund to finance litigation arbitration entrusted to racially or gender diverse lead counsel. And last but not least, law firms can be instrumental in promoting regional uh, diversity, racial, uh, race in terms of race, region, origin. They can do so through hiring, through mentorships, through partner promotion, and obviously to, uh, through arbitrator uh, selection. It's hard to say, uh, to predict which initiative will produce which result uh, they all somehow supplement each other 
and uh, they all deserve uh, attention and support in the interest of a dispute settlement system that is legitimate and perceived as such by all stakeholders, a legitimate international dispute settlement that the world needs in troubled times more than ever. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gabriel. We'll wait now for the speakers of the, set, the first panel uh, to join us in the meeting, and we will soon begin. We are just waiting a second for uh, our last panelist to join us. So, uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Columbia International Arbitration Association, I would like to thank you all, panelists and our amazing audience, for joining us this morning. Before we start the first panel, we would like to make some quick announcements. For those interested in CLE credits, this panel is accredited for 1.5 credits for skills. You will need to submit the attendance form and the evaluation form which are available to download at CAD's website to the email therein indicated. Please record all attendance verification codes displayed during the program. You will need them to fill the attendance form. Review CAD's website to see the instructions regarding the CLE credits. We have also updated, uploaded reading materials related to the topic of this panel. In addition, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this year's CAD must be held online with the advantage, however, that we have been able to waive the registration fee and to make CAD 2022 free of charge. That said, in light of the current situation in Ukraine and of the many conflicts that are still raging, uh, raging worldwide, we would like to invite all participants to make a donation to a humanitarian organization of your choice. With that said, uh, we would like to introduce our moderator for today, our dear Professor uh, Robert Smith. Robert Smith is an independent international arbitrator and adjunct professor of law at Columbia Law School. He's also a former partner at Simpson Thatcher, where he chaired the firm's international arbitration practice. Uh, Professor Smith received his Bachelor of Arts from Cornell University, JD from Columbia Law School, and Diplôme de Tout de Profondie from Sorbonne in Paris. So, Professor Smith, you have the floor. Thank you, um, and good morning, everyone. The uh, topic of our panel this morning is 
is international arbitration keeping up with new ways of doing business? And uh, I must confess that your moderator is a bit nervous about this topic because I feel like an old dog being asked to teach new tricks. Um, back in the 1990s, way back then, one Friday night, I was at work and I posted on a listserv platform an article that I'd written about electronic discovery in international arbitration, which was a futuristic topic back then. And I sent it to the IBA arbitration committee and all IBA members to consider in connection with contemplated changes to the IBA rules. So I leave work Friday evening, and then I go home expecting a nice relaxing weekend. I wake up Saturday morning, and I have received literally hundreds of emails from all over the world, angry emails from civil law and other all kinds of lawyers saying, say no to electronic discovery and international arbitration. Say no to submit. Um, I, I thought my uh, international arbitration career was over and technology still makes me uncomfortable. But fortunately, I have wonderful panelists here today to help spare me from humiliating myself discussing new technology issues in our trade. Um, Sophie Nader is an international arbitrator extraordinaire based in London. She co-founded ArbTech, a global online community forum focused on technology and dispute resolution, created the Naper Prize in International Arbitration, which is open to all you young scholars. Uh, I have Eduardo Silva Romero here, who's co-chair of Deckert's International Arbitration Practice, professor of investment arbitration at Sciences Po, and basically on everybody's shortlist for arbitrators in investment treaty and Latin America related arbitrations. The, the shortlist is kind of Eduardo and everybody else. Um, and then Judge Brower, who I could spend the rest of our session today describing his qualifications, currently at 20 Essex, partner at White and Case, acting legal advisor, State Department, judge of Iran U.S. Claims Tribunal. Uh, I could go on, but I won't. Uh, let me turn to the format of our panel today. Uh, Amara's Law which was articulated by a Stanford scientist, Roy Amara, is that we tend to overestimate the impact of new technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. So we've organized our panel to address first today's short run technology issues in international arbitration and second, tomorrow's longer run technology issues. Uh, the today issues are gonna focus on remote hearings and Eduardo and Charlie are gonna share their experiences uh, with remote hearings, which I think you know, we're all doing today and many overestimate will be the way of the future, uh, even post pandemic. And the tomorrow issues will focus on smart contracts and arbitration in the metaverse. And Sophie will explain what those things are and leave us to underestimate at our own risk their impact in the future. Um, as we go forward, please feel free to um, chat I, uh, any questions you have, and I'll try to put them to the panelists. We would like to keep this as um, interactive as possible. Uh, so with that, let's turn to today's issues, which are uh, involve remote hearings. Um, I would ask uh, Eduardo first to share his thoughts on remote hearings from the council's perspective, and then we'll hear from Judge Brower on remote hearings from the arbitrator perspective. Uh, Eduardo? Uh, thank you, Rob, and uh, let me thank the organizers for this very kind invitation to be in, in today's uh, Columbia Arbitration Day. 
Uh, it has been uh, two years uh, during which we have been forced uh, to participate in hearings uh, remotely. And uh, of course, we shouldn't complain about it. Uh, we should be grateful uh, because we have been simply lucky to be able to continue our work uh, in a different in a different way. Um, what I see today regarding uh, these remote hearings is that we may uh, identify two psychological moments in relation to this new uh, way to conduct hearings. Um, the first moment uh, occurred, let's say, 18 months ago, in which uh, we all, I, I submit to you, forced ourselves to like online hearings and remote hearings. And we forced ourselves to like these type of hearings because we didn't have any choice. And we better uh, adopted some reasons to like them. But now, and this is the second uh, psychological moment, now that um, uh, we uh, are hopeful that the sanitary situation is improving, um, we are seeing um, these remote hearings uh, differently. And uh, we are now finding some disadvantages in it. So these two moments um, really condition the, the few remarks that I'll share with you today about uh, uh, the advantages and uh, disadvantages of remote hearings from uh, the council uh, perspective. If, if we come first of all to the advantages, uh, to try to be positive um, to start with, uh, I, I see four main advantages of remote hearings uh, from a very down to earth uh, logistical council perspective. The first uh, advantage is uh, that on my experience, um, remote hearings are great for uh, lead counsel to be properly assisted without uh, the arbitrators and opposing counsel noticing that you are being assisted. Uh, I explained myself, uh, given that uh, the tribunal and opposing counsel only see the face of counsel uh, either uh, making oral submissions or uh, examining a witness, uh, you can receive a small papers or you can look at uh, a team's chat and uh, get comments and help uh, which go unnoticed uh, thanks to uh, these electronic uh, means. Uh, I should say that uh, this uh, works uh, either if the team is uh, all together in a single place or in different places. But on experience again, I have found that remote hearings are much better when uh, all the members of the council team are in the same place, which is a small paradox of the entire proposition because uh, if for remote hearings to be really effective, you need all the members of your team in a single place, um, that is, is not really the aim of having these um, uh, remote hearings, uh, especially because of the sanitary um, circumstances. The second advantage I see, uh, again, very down to earth uh, of these remote hearings is how the documents are managed. Uh, I find uh, very helpful that everyone is looking at the same document at the same time and at the same pace, which is the document being shown, of course, on, on the screen. Uh, that uh, has made me discover excellent operators of a, 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 an electronic core bundle, which is prepared for, for the hearing. Great platforms, uh, we, we all know them by now, uh, of these operators uh, running uh, remote hearings. And I have noticed that this way of showing documents uh, really um, help gaining a lot of time during the proceedings. Uh, we, we can recall with some nostalgia, at least from my perspective, um, the time that the witness took to open tab four of the bundle 
and look for page 15 of the specific document and uh, how the witness didn't find the page and uh, some member of the council team helped that witness find that page. Now, I think this uh, this time, even, even in future in-person hearings, that time is gone. Uh, I, I believe all the uh, showing the documents in the future should probably be um, uh, electronic. Uh, there is, however, one small uh, uh, problem is that I have found uh, some lawyers, especially from England, uh, who find that uh, it is against, they say, natural justice not to have a printed uh, core bundle next to the witness or the expert uh, during the examination of that witness of, or that expert. So that's something uh, to overcome, I think, culturally that uh, eventually will, will happen. The third advantage that I see is, uh, is one which is obvious, is the protection of the environment, uh, essentially because we print less papers uh, in um, remote hearings. And the last advantage is also obvious, which is that uh, um, remote hearings are less expensive because uh, council and everywhere, everyone is not traveling, uh, at least in theory. I should say on my experience that since we have found in the last two years that it's important for remote hearings to have the council team together in a single place, uh, some traveling has happened. Uh, some uh, of the members of our team who are in the US or in, in, in London have traveled, uh, for instance, to Paris to participate in these hearings from a single place. So uh, there is still some traveling cost, perhaps because of our um, bias against the idea of having the members of the team in different places. Um, but that's something that I guess that someone uh, could overcome. So given that uh, I feel I am personally very much into the uh, second psychological uh, status or state towards uh, uh, remote hearings, um, I, I, I'll spend more time speaking of the disadvantages <laughs> of this type of, of, um, of ventures. And I'll, uh, I'll go through rapidly through uh, six, six disadvantages of, uh, of uh, remote hearings. Um, the first, which is uh, one that many people uh, refer to, is the difficulty that one has uh, on the screen to perceive the reactions of other participants in the hearing and essentially the members of the tribunal. Uh, it, it is true that in person hearings, because of the eye contact, you can feel whether an argument is being understood or both uh, by the tribunal. And uh, uh, during the examination of witnesses or experts, you can also notice more easily whether a line of questioning is, uh, is, uh, is over because the tribunal is not interested anymore in it. Um, so um, there is a small uh, issue of, uh, of reading, reading the tribunal. And uh, uh, in, uh, at least on my experience in these remote hearings, uh, you don't see opposing counsel. Uh, because of the protocol or, or the etiquette which is being adopted, uh, which implies that uh, only the person is speaking and the tribunal um, should uh, have the camera on. So you, you don't know how your uh, opponent is, is uh, reacting to, to anything, something that happens uh, in in-person hearings. Uh, the second uh, disadvantage is, is also uh, uh, quite based on, on, uh, on our experience, uh, is what I would call lack of adrenaline. Um, in in-person hearings, uh, the fact that you are interacting in a single room creates uh, a very uh, special dynamic, uh, I, I would say, uh, which uh, brings you uh, from beginning to end uh, of the hearing. I find that you don't have the same uh, excitement in uh, uh, in these remote hearings. Uh, so somehow, uh, counsel are more relaxed, and uh, and uh, curiously, you you are even more tired uh, in in this type of electronic hearings because of uh, specifically the lack uh, of of adrenaline. Uh, and so, I suspect uh, counsel performance in remote hearings is not as uh, efficient and uh, and good as it could be and is in uh, in um, in person hearings third disadvantage 
um, also from council uh, perspective, is uh, uh, the, the difficulties that uh, we find remotely uh, to prepare the hearing. Uh, the practice used to be uh, that two weeks, the two weeks uh, just before the hearing, uh, the team of lawyers, witnesses, experts, everyone got confined to get prepared. So now that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, we are all uh, attending, I don't know how many video conferences per day. And so uh, during preparation, you may have one hour here from uh, the witness, two hours here from the expert. And the lack of concentration of preparation, I believe, uh, is diminishing the quality of preparation. So there is something uh, to rethink about whether some type of uh, electronic confinement is, is possible. But uh, uh, so far, I have the impression it's not really in um, uh, the customs uh, of all of us. Uh, fourth uh, disadvantage, uh, if the members of the team, if the client are in different uh, locations, uh, there are some uh, difficult coordination issues uh, for which I, I don't need to, uh, to explain. I, I found it particularly diff difficult when the client couldn't come to be with uh, the team of lawyers in a single place, because that, that creates uh, um, some difficulties in uh, receiving the instructions uh, on time. Uh, there can be a, an issue of uh, time zone, uh, which uh, obviously is a, the obvious uh, inconvenience that we can find in, in these hearings. Fifth disadvantage, which is quite important from my perspective, uh, is a time issue. Uh, as we know, uh, the hearing day uh, remotely is uh, shorter than the hearing day uh, in person. That has been uh, decided, I think, rightly, because being uh, at the screen um, 10 hours is really uh, impossible. Uh, but the, 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 the consequence of this is that, is that since the, the parties have limited time to present their cases, uh, my experience is that arbitrators now tend to put less questions to counsel and less questions to the witnesses. So I think um, uh, counsel are not benefiting uh, from more questions from the tribunal, which is always, I mean, from my perspective, a great, great guidance in, uh, in, uh, for any lawyer to, to present, uh, to present a, a case. So I think uh, overall, this is bad for the process, but I, I understand the arbitrators who refrain from asking questions, especially if uh, they feel that they are, uh, so to speak, stealing time from the parties uh, to put forward uh, their cases. And last point, uh, which uh, to some extent is linked to what uh, Professor Kaufman Kola mentioned a, a, a moment ago, uh, are what I would call technical issues related uh, to some parties of some council located in some countries, uh, specifically uh, countries in which the internet connection is, is not good. Uh, so if the internet connection doesn't work, uh, all the process uh, doesn't work, or places where there is no um, equipment um, to properly participate uh, in, in these hearings. Uh, I've seen as uh, solutions, uh, uh, people traveling to a, a, another country where there could be better connection, but that's not the idea uh, behind uh, these hearings. And uh, I've seen some platforms providing kits uh, to the different participants uh, for them to have the equipment. Uh, I don't know to what extent these uh, kits could be sent to all places, uh, but especially, especially of course, uh, now. So uh, in conclusion, um, let me advance the three three ideas, especially in light of one legal question that comes up uh, from time to time is whether um, the tribunal um, can legally impose uh, a remote hearing uh, over uh, parties who prefer to have an in-person hearing. We have read many papers on, on this issue uh, recently. Uh, I believe that the issue, uh, and perhaps I hope that the issue will be moot, uh, why? Because I think remote hearings uh, over time will be limited to some very specific, not to say exceptional cases. Uh, I think remote hearings will be uh, especially used for 
uh, interim measures questions, which need to be organized urgently, as we know, uh, simple jurisdictional uh, pleas, uh, questions, uh, some legal issues. Uh, I mean, I can imagine um, a phase of the proceedings on what is the applicable law to an issue that, that could be done uh, or tried um, remotely. And uh, another experience that I, I think is, uh, is, is good uh, remotely uh, is uh, exit uh, annulment hearings. That could happen also uh, since these are legal, legal processes uh, remotely. The second conclusion, second idea is that um, something that ha I have experienced and I, I find doesn't work is what is called the hybrid hearings. Because the hybrid hearings create uh, inequalities between the parties. Let's, let's uh, assume uh, that the two witnesses from uh, the claimant can make it and attend in person, but the two witnesses from respondent uh, don't. Uh, obviously, the examination of a witness in person is different from the examination of witnesses uh, remotely, and that can create some inequality uh, at least uh, from my perspective. So the hybrid nature of hearings really need to be uh, rethought and uh, there has to be the same quantity of people on both sides attending of the same, uh, let's say, caliber and then mm, the same number of people not attending from both parties also from the same caliber so that the hybrid hearings could work. And uh, you, you already guessed it, that doesn't happen very often uh, the, the the situations um, the situations um, are always unequal in relation to who can attend this type of of hearings and and lastly um, something that uh, my, my uh, current uh, uh, state regarding this uh, uh, remote hearings uh, has really confirmed is that uh, at the end of the day this uh, arbitral justice that we we have and and we we cherish uh, is is uh, uh, a mechanism of human justice for human beings. And so human contact, I, I find, uh, is still uh, of the essence. Thank you, Rob. Th thank you, Eduardo. Um, curiously, many of the uh, disadvantages that Eduardo mentions from a council's perspective are advantages from the arbitrator's perspective. What, if Eduardo can't see me sometimes on the screen, that's good for an arbitrator. Sometimes we like to shut the council out. If there's a little lack of adrenaline in the room, that can be good. Let's focus on the merits. Uh, I know from my years as counsel that going to trial or hearing is a show, a performance. But from the arbitrator's perspective, we're just trying to get the case right. And sometimes a lack of energy and just a focus on the issues is exactly what we want. Um, in terms of Eduardo says, well, also the hearing days are constrained in terms of hours. For an arbitrator, that's a great thing. The, the fewer hours we have to you know, sit in a room uh, listening to witnesses, potentially the better. Um, and it does tend to focus counsel on um, the absolute essential in the case, which is what arbitrators want. They want um, counsel to focus on the key issues and um, or not, remote hearings the tendency to focus counsel. Uh, I, I think from the arbitrator perspective, and I'll, uh, I, I think uh, Judge Brower is having some technical problems getting in, so I'm channeling Judge Brower a little now, uh, as well as myself, but one of the challenges of remote hearings from the arbitrator's perspective is deliberations. Um, you don't get the same... I mean, I mean, on the one hand, when you have Zoom hearings, it makes informal, the kind of informal tribunal deliberations you have in the, in the bathroom impossible. And that may be a good thing. 
Um, but it also infects kind of the, 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 the whole nature of the informal deliberation process. You tend to discuss the issues less um, and uh, less intensely when your time is on a screen with the arbitrators. I've now, my last two arbitrations as arbitrator, um, or, uh, I have never met the arbitrators other than remotely. And that's a strange interpersonal dynamic to have with your arbitrators. Um, in the last case I did, it was interesting. We, um, the arbitrators got together in one place in Paris, um, but all the counsel and the witnesses participated remotely. And that worked out well in several respects. Um, uh, I see that uh, Charlie has been able to join us. Charlie, you want to unmute yourself and uh, chime in here? We're, yeah. we're just getting into remote hearings from the arbitrator's perspective. I thought, oh, wait a minute. I think I'm, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I don't know where the show is because I've been on the line with uh, with the uh, IT people. But uh, well, you know. well, well, basically, Eduardo has told us about um, his experience from the council's perspective of right. remote hearings, and we're right. interested to hear what your experience has been from the arbitrator's seat. No, right, I understand that. I don't want to interrupt another. You just tell me when to go ahead. Go ahead. You're just interrupting me, and that's a good thing. Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't say so. Well, um, as you've seen uh, from my late uh, arrival, um, the problem for people like me is that I can remember having to learn how to use a television set because when I was uh, in younger years, there was no television. Um, we, we weren't brought up to be technically competent of necessity as younger generations uh, are. And um, the uh, difficulty, of course, is um, you have to uh, learn this. And of course, I've having, been having to learn for at least 20 or 30 years since we first started having uh, computers when I was uh, arrived in The Hague and for the first time in 1983, there were no com there were no computers, but we didn't have desktops or laptops, and uh, ones had to learn. Now I'm sitting um, at my uh, what was supposed to be my dining room table, but it is covered with two uh, separate computers, a monitor screen, an iPad. And sometimes we also have to be, as I just was, uh, on the um, on the telephone. If you weren't, um, if you didn't start learning about these things um, until you were middle aged, it's quite a uh, it's quite a process. Uh, have you seen? I followed all the directions, but I'm the, or I thought I followed all the directions, and I didn't get in so quickly. The um, now, actually. Um, I remember being at the World's Fair in New York City of 1939 as a rather small child, but I remember it. And I'm the only one on this program who ever heard, I'm sure, of the main feature of that fair, which was called the Trilon and Paris Fair. You can look them up in, uh, in uh, Wikipedia. So I've had an awful lot to learn. Some of this also is when you're in cases um, that have uh, simultaneous uh, interpretation. Uh, well, that's why I have uh, the iPad in particular, because there are different systems uh, depending upon which medium is uh, used uh, for uh, following the language or languages that you wish to. So this has been quite something. <clears throat> However, the biggest shock uh, to me from uh, remote hearings frankly, is having to get up at three o'clock in the morning, my time in Washington, because I'm usually on the western end of uh, an, a geographically extended case with people uh, on in Europe, 
uh, sometimes in South America as well, out in the Middle East, uh, and even somewhat beyond. Uh, now, that would be, uh, I basically take two hours uh, getting up at three o'clock to get on a 5 a.m. Uh, my time uh, problem. And of, of course, one could jokingly say, well, you only get, you only, you only have to get half dressed because only any, anybody can only see your upper body and, and you could have tattered jeans or your pajama bottoms or whatever on. Well, that's a kind of a funny thing, but Frankly, I even have shoes on. I'm not barefoot. I've got everything that I should because that's the way it's done. Um, this has happened to me quite uh, a lot. So you have to, uh, yeah, you better be good and healthy and fit because you got to adjust your system to getting very little sleep uh, sometimes. Um, and then the days are shorter uh, because, you know, say I'm getting up at three o'clock, getting on at five o'clock. Uh, the guys out in the Middle East are, uh, you know, it's coming up on dinner time and you can only have four hours. I've had cases in which you only have four hours a day. So you have more, more days. The, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, now the interesting part apart from that is all of the devices that are required uh, in order to be sure that witnesses are not getting prompted from uh, sort of off camera uh, somewhere. I've had cases in which uh, the tribunal insists uh, that a cam the, the room be swept uh, with the hand camera to show all four walls what the setup is and, and identify anyone else who is sitting uh, in the room uh, and um, then everybody has to say that, um, you know, we're the only ones here. Here's who I am. Here's who's this one. Uh, I don't find it uh, difficult, uh, as I think counsel uh, have said in many cases, maybe some arbitrators, to uh, follow the uh, proceedings or the uh, examination, uh, to me, isn't uh, any more uh, difficult. And uh, some of you might know that as an arbitrator, uh, I ask a lot of questions of certain uh, witnesses, uh, particularly where credibility uh, is, uh, is an issue. Um, now, part of the disadvantage for the arbitrators is if a question comes up, you can't put your three heads together on the uh, table, at, you know, turn off, um, don't have a hot mic. Uh, and you decide right there some uh, issue. But you have to go into a separate room uh, to do that, hoping that the technology is working and nobody else is hearing what you're, uh, what, what you're saying. That can be uh, a very uh, uh, di disruptive. Now, um, I would say from the point of view of arbitrators, um, what is an advantage in one sense, a financial advantage for the uh, parties and counsel in a uh, remote uh, uh, hearing uh, of an arbitration uh, is really uh, a deprivation uh, of the building of relationships among arbitrators. I've been doing this for so long. There are uh, certain arbitrators I've sat with quite a number of times. It just happens to be that way. So if everybody's in the same city, the same hearing on the same time, the arbitrators are likely to have dinner together uh, some of the evenings, if not all or most of the evenings. And that has two advantages. Uh, you, um, you get to know each other. Uh, better if you don't already know each other. And if you already know each other, we get to know each other even better. I've often said our community is not a geographical community. It's not a family community. It's a bunch of people spread all around the continents of the uh, world, except uh, Antarctica. Um, and we only get together when we're in arbitrations together or going to uh, conferences and getting to know people over a period of time develops your understanding of um, you know who, who you think is uh, good and and in some cases who you might uh, not be unhappy never to see again which does happen from time to 
at a time. And it also offers an opportunity for, you know, very informal, uh, we're having a dinner and some wine and, uh, about what the day's events, what we thought of the witnesses, what we thought of arguments, uh, what we think might be missing uh, uh, somewhere. It's not deliberations. You don't deliberate until the hearing is all over and the final submissions, <coughs> if there are post-hearing submissions, uh, are in. Now, I'm sure the clients are happy because um, uh, that it's remote, a lot of uh, airfare bills, um, and I'm sure we're thought to stay only in five-star hotels and eat only three-star Michelin uh, meals. I have to tell you, that's not exactly accurate. <laughs> happens from time to time. But um, uh, so savings of uh, expenses uh, is always welcome um, to the parties. But it is a disadvantage for the development uh, of the core of, um, of uh, arbitrators. Now, finally, uh, I will say um, remote hearings, I don't think are going to go away completely. Um, it's the less uh, or the smaller the demand uh, of the uh, uh, claimant, uh, the more likely people are wanting to uh, save money, not spend too money much money uh, on the case, and I think uh, remote will be uh, reasonable, uh, I mean, even within, let's say, the United States, if the uh, claims are not too large. The problem, of course, is that the smaller the claims, the more likely people are to be able to get together geographically. And, and when you get to the multi, multi, multi-million, even billion-dollar claims, uh, uh, investor state claims, uh, where uh, certainly there are, um, how should I say, uh, political aspects uh, to it when you're dealing with a state or a state-controlled um, uh, uh, ent uh, entity. Uh, I think the, the bet the farm uh, cases uh, will uh, more likely stay, uh, go into uh, in-person hearings. So we're not completely away from it. Uh, and of course, uh, COVID-19 and its uh, variations are uh, not entirely predictable. In any event, that's basically uh, my uh, 10 minutes of uh, comments on how it looks from the uh, point of view of, uh, well, I, will, I won't describe myself other as seasoned and others will make <laughs> their other, whatever judgments uh, uh, they make. And uh, sorry for the uh, apparent lack of uh, ability to get on the uh, screen here at the appropriate time. Thank you for your patience and uh, it's a joy to be here. Thank well, you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, I think we're, we're all grateful to know that you're wearing shoes. Uh, I cannot say the same for myself. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me ask you uh, a question. Um, I noticed in the ICC Commission's recent 2022 report on technology and international arbitration, the report talks about an arbitrator's duty of technological competence. That... That phrase sent shivers down my spine, and I'm interested to get um, both of your reactions, uh, um, Judge Brower, your reaction in terms of um, having a duty of technological competence, and Eduardo, I guess the question from a counsel's perspective might be, do you consider um, arbitrator candidates technological competence among the criteria you consider when you're choosing arbitrators? So uh, you'd like me to answer first? Yes, let's get it, your view no. first. Uh, I, I, get, I guess I've, um, uh, <laughs> in this program, uh, getting on late, graphically uh, <laughs> proven uh, that I don't have the uh, full degree. The problem was that you had to... Uh, my browser is, uh, so far, I mean, I have all the browsers, but I usually use Safari. And uh, as soon as I got on the one that they, the one that they indicated, it just went, anyway, here I am. But absolutely, uh, one needs to be uh, technologically 
uh, co competent as an uh, arbitrator. And you've got these systems like, uh, well, I've, I think of Opus, where if somebody hires Opus to, uh, in, the, in the case, you've got, you know, uh, you got to be able to be sure you have uh, documents that are shown on one screen and you're looking uh, at everybody in the room or whoever is talking at the time on another screen. And I have to t tell you, and I'm <clears throat> as uh, some of you know, I'm sitting in, <coughs> excuse me, three cases at the International Court of Justice as a uh, judge uh, ad hoc. Um, and I find that the um, system for dealing with translations getting on uh, usually English uh, for me, it's only English and French there is very different from some other systems. Um, you have to even master the particular, whether you're on Teams or Zoom uh, or WebEx, um, it's all different. So you absolutely have to do it. Now, I haven't had problems in arbitrations with the uh, uh, technology, notwithstanding the uh, graphic example of uh, techno incompetence uh, that I've given uh, this morning. But I think it's, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely necessary. And you remember the phrase, every day you must learn something new in this life. Um, in this field for sure, and I think generally. So it's needed, and also security, security issue, not to uh, protecting everything is everybody's concern. Um, so you've got to be as well uh, equipped as possible to uh, not have things hacked into your um, documents. Thank you. Eduardo, any thoughts before we turn to tomorrow's issues? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, well, I, I haven't really experienced uh, or heard of any uh, incompetent, uh, technologically speaking, arbitrator. Uh, well, we, we are all incompetent about these technological issues. But the truth uh, is that in practice, uh, before we attend these uh, uh, remote hearings, uh, there are a couple of, of trial sessions which uh, make sure that uh, the incompetence is uh, uh, to the extent possible removed. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, I think these trials have become really uh, customary. Uh, and because of that, the issue in practice, uh, uh, I suspect, doesn't arise very often. So I, I was a bit surprised when I, when I read the document uh, from the ICC, which uh, seems to uh, elevate this technological competence to the level of, uh, let's say, availability uh, of arbitrators, because uh, in reality, I don't think there is a, uh, much of a problem. Thank you. I, I, I certainly agree. Um, let, let's move from today's issues with remote hearings to tomorrow's issues with smart contracts and blockchain arbitration. Uh, some people predict that smart contracts and blockchain arbitration are going to replace contract law and dispute resolution by international arbitrators in national courts, essentially with code in the future. Um, Sophie will explain for us what all this means and whether um, what role smart contracts and blockchain arbitration are likely to have going forward. Sophie. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be at the Columbia Arbitration Day once again. Uh, thank you for having me. I will just uh, preface this very briefly by saying, uh, first of all, these are uh, issues for the future. They're also um, present technologies that exist today, some of them in experimental form, uh, but certainly they are um, they are things that, that are presently existing. They are not science fiction. The other thing that I will say uh, is that in light of the current tragedy that's uh, befell uh, the Ukraine, is that it has, although I am going to talk about a uh, future view of things, um, I do have my feet firmly anchored in the present uh, reality. And, and when you have a conflict of that uh, magnitude or any uh, tragedy befalling uh, an area, 
is that you lose the ability um, to access technology. You lose the ability to have a network. And so this is what, if only for that reason, uh, I don't uh, believe for one second that technology will uh, override uh, the uh, possibility and opportunity to have uh, in-person hearings in safe, neutral uh, areas. Having said this, uh, I'm going to ask, please, that my slides be put up. I, I did, we, we said no slides, uh, and I prepared a few slides because uh, I thought it might, a visual might help uh, with some of the concepts that I'm going to talk about. Um, and by all means, this is not meant to prevent uh, or, or um, fetter any questions in the comments uh, on the chat as we go along. Please um, put them in and we can address them. Um, I, I want to start with uh, smart contracts. Um, smart contracts, first of all, the first thing I will say is this field of legal tech is full of misnomers. Uh, it is a field that has appropriated itself some legal terms like contract, like arbitration, like fairness. That is not what a lawyer understands they are. It, it is something else. So you have to be a little bit, every time you read uh, the techno jargon uh, on, the, on blockchain or cryptocurrency or whatever, you have to be a little bit suspicious of the, the term does not mean uh, its legal signification. And, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, so the first thing I will say uh, quite clearly is that smart contracts are not contracts. A contract is something that um, states the rights and obligations of uh, both parties. It is not uh, an instrument that does something. Uh, smart contracts are a line of code that essentially automatizes the performance of certain obligations of the contract. So for example, uh, transferring crypto tokens, unlocking uh, an escrow account to uh, deliver uh, s some money, or uh, something as simple as unlocking an Amazon um, um, safe for you to get your purchase. That's what a smart contract is. Uh, it is uh, not the substance of an agreement. So for example, when we discuss this presentation, um, my fellow panelists asked, you know, how do you code fairness? How do you code, code um, reasonable endeavors? Uh, the, question, the answer to that question is we, are, we cannot at this stage because codes are uh, digital language is very binary. And it can, uh, it can uh, translate things like pay the claimant when this happens, uh, but it cannot translate, uh, for example, I will... Uh, do may have reasonable endeavors to for, for, for this to happen. I will perform this obligation in good faith. This is not happening at the moment. Uh, a, a big endeavor of ArpTech uh, at our very modest level is to have that conversation with the coders and the developers so that they understand how, a mind, how our minds work and how uh, these concepts arise and we can understand the limits of what code can do. Now, what it can, what what smart contract can do is automize the performance of part of the contract that can be automized. So you can imagine, for example, in a construction um, site and a construction contract or long-term agreement, you can have milestones where certain things are performed and then automatically paid. Uh, this can be automized and is actually, as we as we are as we speak, uh, something that can be automized and 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 it is very efficient in terms of paper trail, uh, in terms of um, transparency of verifying the history of obligations, because it's happening on the blockchain, which is an online transparent uh, record and ledger of, of, uh, of these obligations. And the question has been po um, posed uh, by uh, some scholars in this field, whether it might not herald uh, a new era or a new way of drafting contracts so that you could um, have a, a traditional contract uh, with a dispute resolution clause and all the information that we write in legalese. And then you have in, in uh, some of those obligations that can be uh, automatized uh, so as to make uh, the performance of the contract uh, more efficient. Uh, it is a, a question mark, but it is something that can be um, considered. I have added a couple of slides just to show you what a smart contract looks like. Um, and it's uh, on Etherscan. Um, 
so this is this is a smart contract um, and as you can see it is um uh, the author of the contract is uh, anonymized. Uh, it is he or she is referred to by uh, their wallet, by their code, by their code name, and uh, they have put on a, a contract that does. I can't tell you what it does, but it is a contract that automatizes. I, I would suggest probably, if I if I'm guessing, uh, the payment uh, of money when certain things happen, which is the usual uh, format that it's taking now. And the actual uh, translation of the rights and obligations of the parties uh, is this. Sorry, I passed on. There we go. So this is what um, what legalese looks like in code. Uh, I am not obviously a coder. I cannot translate what that looks like, but it, it shows you immediately that you are talking about uh, an area where um, you must be able to speak to the developers and the software engineers um, in order for them to understand how to translate these obligations as accurately as possible uh, into, into code. The last thing I will say about smart contracts, um, unless there are any questions on this, is that uh, in the past few days, the European uh, Commission has issued the Data Act, which is a piece of uh, European legislation that is meant to, uh, in, in very broad terms, provide fairness uh, in, and transparency in the treatment of data and how you can uh, essentially uh, control the data uh, that you put out there. And one of the points that has um, taken, captured the, uh, the attention of the, tech, the legal tech community is that there is a provision in the Data Act that says that um, smart contracts uh, will be required to have uh, embedded into their code an ability to interrupt or stop the automation process uh, when certain pieces of data are being compromised in the way that the Act provides. Um, it is very technical and not something that I want to dwell on, but it's very interesting because that would mean that a lot of the smart contracts that exist at the moment would be non-compliant uh, with this law because they are made to essentially keep doing what, they, what they're asked to do when certain milestones happen. And this, what the Data Act is asking them to do is complicate a little bit um, and, and introduce a layer of, of, uh, of nuance or complication to interrupt that uh, automation when certain uh, certain thresholds of data leaks uh, are, are met. Uh, so this, um, this is going to be what I have to say on the smart contracts. Your, your takeaway message is they are not contracts. They are automation and they are a line of code. Right. My next slide is a little bit is a, as, a, as a precursor to um, what I'm going to say. Um, about blockchain uh, and blockchain arbitration. Uh, I'm not going to, to, by now, I think most of us uh, have a very good sense what blockchain is. It is uh, this record online of, uh, of transactions that is uh, open uh, to, for everyone to see that is between um, an anonymized uh, people who transact with each other. But the essence of it, and the reason why it is such a big disruptor uh, to a field like arbitration, or the courts for that matter, is that it is decentralized. It is not an institution that has a central control of blockchain. It is several um, people behind a computer that all have an exact replica of what is on that blockchain and can all vouch for the fact that it remains immutable. And if a change is made to it, everyone knows that that change is made. It is not a decision that is taken centrally. Now, arbitration is not as centralized as the courts are, obviously, but we still have a degree of centralization in the sense that we have, you know, arbitration institution, we have a community of arbitrators, we have um, a certain, um, we, we are a community. We are we are a people who are uh, do a certain type of decision making uh, in a collegiate manner. We know who each other is. Uh, there is a complete uh, and, and great reliance on uh, who the individuals are. This is this is what it is at the moment. Now, there is a phenomenon called blockchain arbitration. Remember, I said beware uh, the name calling. It is not arbitration. It is a way of deciding disputes on the blockchain. They call it arbitration um, 
very loosely because it, I don't know, sounded good. And also, I suspect, because there is a willingness to attract at one point down the line the application of the New York Convention. Uh, we are not far from it uh, there yet. Uh, but uh, that uh, is another um, example of playing fast and loose with concepts. I want to talk about blockchain arbitration uh, because it, at the moment it is uh, limited to, I would say, disputes that arise in crypto transactions. So example, for example, if you want to list a certain crypto token, it has to meet a certain criteria of eligibility or availability on a certain list. If it doesn't, then it is booted off. And who makes the decision? It is those panels of jurors who are other um, um, blockchain users in the crypto sphere and who essentially take a view um, as uh, individually, as a panel, uh, and, then, and then the majority decision prevails. Is that token accepted? Is it not accepted? So one of these um, applications, I've talked about it uh, actually two years ago, and last time I was in, um, uh, at the uh, Columbia Arbitration Day in person uh, with Federico Ast, who is the CEO of, of this application called Kleros, uh, who sits on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, I will I will summarize a little bit what Cleros does. The reason why I, I chose to speak about them is I would say they are probably the most, uh, first of all, it is humans making decisions. Uh, they are anonymized, but they are humans. This is not an automated artificial intelligence decision-making uh, system. Uh, they uh, These humans uh, who are blockchain users self-select uh, to decide a certain type of dispute amongst Cleros's they have maybe seven, six or seven courts, namely uh, uh, fora uh, for dispute resolution of certain uh, typical crypto disputes of different kinds, uh, and they they self-select by putting by by staking money in that court, and a little bit as if I were to say, well, I would like to be on this list of arbitrators, and I need to pay for that. That's that's the same idea, and they stake some money to be um, selected as arbitrators or as, as jurors, and where there is a dispute between, let's say, uh, two uh, users of the blockchain, one of whom had pr promised to transfer a good to the other, and that good is not compliant or the money doesn't arrive, uh, the dispute is automatically sent uh, to Cleros, and the panel is formed randomly. According amongst those who have uh, selected, and those people don't know each other, uh, and they come to a decision according to a system that is called um, the shelling point, and that the shelling point is a uh, mathematical um, 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 theory that uh, says that um, someone must decide in a, in a way that they think the majority will choose. And the way it works, it's called game theory. And the way it works is like this. So let's say um, we have a, a number of outcomes possible for a certain dispute. And then the jurors look at these outcomes and they say, OK, I, have to I want to decide with the majority on this. What would the majority decide? And, he, and, the, and the, the jury li is likely to say the most likely outcome of this for a majority is going to be the number 1,000 because it's a nice round number. And then you have obviously all the, the anchoring uh, processes going on in the brain. And then 1,000 is chosen and uh, 1,000 ends up being the majority decision. That's how game theory works. That is how Kleros has chosen to incentivize its jurors because to incentivize them to come to a consensus decision is uh, difficult when they don't know each other, unlike the community that we belong to, when their reputation is not at stake where no one knows who they are. And the way that they have decided to incentivize them is, the, is that is by financially uh, rewarding those who arrive at the consensus decision, at the majority decision, and by penalizing those who don't. Now, there is a, an appeal system uh, that I'm not going to even get into, but this is, in very broad terms, how it works. There are other, uh, Kleros is not alone in this, uh, in this space, there are other um, applications. One of them is called JUR, J-U-R, where you also have a smart contract system, but when a dispute arises, it is farmed out to a traditional um, low-cost 
uh, expedited uh, arbitration system. So there you have a, a bit of a hybrid system where the dispute arising on the blockchain is essentially sent to a traditional tribunal that comes to a decision in, in uh, very, very quickly. Now, Kleros, obviously, we're talking about uh, decisions in a matter of hours, at most a couple of days. Uh, JIR takes a little bit longer, but we're talking about maybe less than a week. This You can see immediately uh, the um, the reason why this is can be a disruption that can be very important for decision making uh, in the online world, given uh, the that it matches the immediacy of uh, online transaction and online transactions between people who essentially do not know each other. The reason why this is a development that matters and that we need to heed is uh, the following. I have a few numbers just to give you an idea of uh, the magnitude of the ecosystem that is cryptocurrency exchanges and transactions. Uh, the market capitalization of cryptocurrency uh, is essentially the, to the total value of all coins, just like, as, like Bitcoin, which is an example, or Ethereum, which is an example of a, a, a cryptocurrency. The total value of these coins is, is calculated by multiplying the number of coins in circulation by the current market price of a single coin. And just to give you an order of magnitude, Bitcoin as a current, currently has a market cap of $788 billion. Ethereum, second in line, has a market cap of $338 billion. So that money is not real money, but that money has a value. And, and I think with a lot of legacy um, lawyers find difficult to comprehend is how do you ascribe value to something that does not exist? And that is, I think, once you get your head around that, you understand that even in that world that is online, even though these goods might be virtual, they still have value. And then where there is value in transactions, there will be disputes. And that is why uh, the um, blockchain arbitration systems that are arising uh, will definitely uh, get into that space and will um, come to uh, adjudicate on uh, an increasingly valuable types of disputes. Um, I when I have a couple of, um, I, will, I will just, I have questions, uh, uh, criticisms, I would say, of the Kleros model alongside what arbitration uh, is. And I would say one of my main uh, criticism is um, the second one, um, where I, the Claro system and blockchain arbitration in, is ge in general is focused on maximizing the payoff to the jurors. It is not particularly focused on, re on, on resolving the party's dispute. The party's dispute is being commoditized. It's being commoditized for the jurors to make money. It's being tokenized. And what, what, whilst this is completely uh, acceptable to a community like the crypto community, because it's all about you know, making money, uh, in order to escalate or elevate uh, a system like Kleros into the mainstream type of justice, I wonder whether that would not be a significant Achilles heel uh, for more uh, mainstream commercial disputes. Uh, at the moment, Kleros is, um, has received grants from the European Commission, uh, as well as from the French state, in order to come up with um, a version of its uh, system that uh, would be more acceptable to uh, mainstream commercial actors. Uh, they are working on this. They have established uh, a fellowship of justice, as they call it, where scholars come on board to, uh, to look at, you know, what is the place of fairness? What is the place of due process uh, in a system such as this? But I would urge all of us uh, not to dismiss these developments, because as with Airbnb, uh, this is a phenomenon that uh, targets at first a very small segment and then starts as, as it carries on and breeds f familiarity uh, and acceptance, it, it starts bleeding into uh, more mainstream areas. I would also say that, to my mind, um, at the moment, I see a landscape of types of disputes. And you have, from the on the left-hand side of my slide, uh, the very sort of 
objective low value binary disputes that can be solved even by artificial intelligence. And there are instances of that. That's not our topic today, but that works. Artificial intelligence oversee, overseen by, by humans. And then you have on the right hand side what we do uh, in traditional legacy international arbitration, the complex uh, decision making, the politically charged stakes, uh, the um, the very uh, nuanced multi-party multi-issue uh, uh, disputes that we that we deal with where I we are not seeing um, blockchain arbitration taking that on board soon however in the middle of that landscape there is a whole um, phenomenon of e-commerce uh, that is completely under the radar because it's what we do is too expensive it's way too long and uh, decentralized justice, uh, what Claros calls what, it, what, it's, what its service is, and JUR, uh, can, can do wonders at making uh, e-commerce um, carry on its wheels, tur carry on turning, and its disputes resolved very quickly in a way that matches the values of the users of e-commerce. So immediacy, transparency, and speed and low cost. Um, I will now uh, say a word about the metaverse. Um, what is the metaverse? It's a, it's a very um, it's a very trendy uh, term right now, especially since uh, Facebook now Meta has stepped into the fold. Um, the metaverse is essentially if you are a gamer, if you if you play games uh, online, uh, you will. That is pretty much what the metaverse is. It's a it's a virtual world. Uh, you put a cap on, and you are immersed into this uh, unreal environment uh, where you can uh, play games against others uh, that are avatars that are you know pictorial representations of others. The metaverse seeks, uh, and here on my slide, it is Web three, and I'm trying to. Uh, puts and it, this is actually not 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 a slide made by me. It is a slide that has been um, published by others. But Web two is what we have right now, and you have this is what social media as we know it is read and write, and it's interactive. There are platforms. It is centralized by Facebook, by others, and then Web three is meant to be uh, about those avatars, those players transacting with each other. They are meant to be able to buy and sell from each other, all uh, at the moment uh, in cryptocurrency, all virtual pieces of land. You have real estate on the metaverse. You have Christie's and Sotheby's selling art on the metaverse. You have banks that have started um, building um, businesses on the metaverse. And again, I have numbers that you know defy comprehension. Uh, the sales of real estate on uh, the four major metaverse platforms, such as Sandbox and Decentralized, topped $500 million last year. And I expected to double that uh, in 2022. Um, someone recently paid um, upwards of $400,000 uh, to have a plot of land next to a plot of land owned by a celebrity, celebrity um, rapper. So again, the fact that uh, the creation of this is completely artificial, unreal, not something that anyone can touch, does not mean that it doesn't have value, does not mean that as a matter of an economy, it does not exist. That economy exists. The, the metaverse to me, and, and here I, uh, Arbtech hosted, I think, probably the first event on this topic back in December last year on dispute resolution in the metaverse. And we started from the premise that this was our chance, uh, first of all, to get involved in this booming economy. And second of all, um, to um, devise a dispute resolution from scratch that would not have the same ills of time, cost, and, and you know, hurdles that we keep complaining in conferences, uh, but uh, keep complaining about in conferences, but don't do very much to alleviate, and, and, and start, start from a blank slate, provide a degree of decision-making that is fair, uh, that is also uh, mirrors the values of those users uh, of the metaverse. And I have... Um, um, recently published um, in um, the, the book in uh, honor of Professor George Berman's career and life, a very short piece where I 
propose, I think a little bit uh, provocatively, but I really do think that one of the answers should be there. And it is that uh, a lot of the, the time and cost components of the legacy arbitration process have to do with um, the fact that procedural due process is something that takes time inherently. It, ha it is something that is time heavy, time reliant, and it just is not suited to this new environment uh, of the online trans transactions. It isn't suited to it just because this is a, a world where we know we know when we go on Amazon and you know you don't wait ages, you pay, your transaction is done in, in minutes, and then you get you get your goods probably the next day. The, the dispute resolution system uh, must match these uh, these areas, and and frankly, I for my money. Uh, the arbitration community, even though uh, we practice a different type of dispute resolution, we do have know-how and experience that could be extremely valuable uh, to devise uh, that type of dispute resolution of the future. I hope uh, this was helpful, uh, at least to understand what smart contracts are not uh, and, and what blockchain arbitration is not. And I would, um, I would welcome uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Sophie. Um, we invite all the um, observers to send any questions you have by chat. But in the meantime, um, I'm still trying to get my mind around this, Sophie. And I guess two comments you made trigger big picture questions for me. One is you described the decision-making process as essentially kind of game theory. And you said that um, in the longer term, there may be a desire to um, get the benefits of New York Convention type protections uh, to this form of arbitration. What's not clear to me is what actually is the role of law in dispute resolution in this in blockchain dispute resolution what it's it it does not have to me an evident place and what would be required to get blockchain dispute resolution to a place where it could actually be considered for new york convention type protections um so the first thing I will say is that uh, it, Kleros uses game theory. Uh, it is very much their thing. Not all types of blockchain dispute resolution systems do. Um, the Kleros' answer to your question is to say um, that at the moment, and at the moment, the disputes that they um, or, that they handle is very much uh, based on the blockchain ecosystem and community and the crypto ecosystem and community, where essentially. It's the equivalent of Lex Mercatoria that governs, what they call the Lex Cryptographica, for lack of a better term, which is essentially, uh, if you cast your mind back to the very early uh, beginnings of arbitration, is the law merchant, the way that things are done, the way that things are done in a trading community. Uh, that, that is the law that applies. I do not see why. Uh, or why not? Uh, there shouldn't be I, why there shouldn't be a, a proper system of law that applies. The difficulty, of course, is that those jurors are not are not lawyers. You know, they are they are. There is no barrier to entry to being a juror. Just that you know the the community, you know how things work, uh, you know uh, what to look for uh, in, in the decision making process. Um, but in in developing this this system, there is no at one point no. Um, reason why there shouldn't be a requirement that it should be lawyers deciding or that 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 can be verified uh, that credentials can be verified that we move towards something closer uh, to what we know I, but th as i said this is a very experimental project but it has the seeds uh, of something uh, that we should uh, that we should heed um, new york convention well i mean we <laughs> I have endless conversations on Telegram with Claros about, you know, what is due process and and whether the New York Convention will uh, accept uh, something like Claros uh, decisions. Uh, at the moment, it's quite clear that um, uh, Claros has a, a huge uh, gap to fill um, in its decision making just because it is unable to show 
uh, any type of, fa um, of uh, procedural fairness. And it is very difficult to see how to translate this uh, procedural fairness in a game theory environment where you essentially put your finger up in the air and say this is going to be the majority decision. Uh, it, uh, to me, there's a, there's a, a disconnect. Um, I will mention very quickly, though, um, that there has been a model law uh, issued by uh, on the on um, something called DAOs, DAO, um, um, decentralized autonomous organizations, which is a, a way, uh, sort of, an associate the way that um, that the blockchain, um, uh, like Claros, for example, is a is a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, the way that they organize themselves as as um, as enterprises on the blockchain, and and that model law. Uh, seeks says very sweepingly that any decision taken uh, in place of a dispute uh, on the on you know in, within the DAOs uh, will have the status of an international arbitration award. And obviously, this is the sort of um, comment that gets me jumping up and down and and, and feedbacking to them. You know, there's not it's not going to happen, and and we need to find another way of making your decision enforceable elsewhere, but the New York Convention won't be it. But I, I would not discount um, these um, these experiments, um, the, the intelligence of the people behind them, and the fact that they, they see there's definitely, as I said, a segment of dispute for which there is a need uh, for that type of dispute resolution tailored to make it more uh, appropriate and more fair procedurally, fairer procedurally. Uh, for parties, and that is just a matter of, of time and and, um, and and trials, I think. Um, I, I did notice in preparing uh, for this that um, some baby steps have been made in terms of even our traditional international arbitration world. Um, you say smart contracts aren't contracts, but I notice that jams has now issued a set of smart contract arbitration rules. So there is movement, you know, in our community to embrace this. Uh, I was struck when I went through the rules, they're really not that different than the ordinary international arbitration rules or domestic arbitration rules. So the question is, is there anything specific to smart contracts that would require specialized arbitral procedures? Um, I confess not to not having read uh, the JAM rules, but if they are not very different from what we have in terms of time periods, for example, uh, then I think they are missing the point with all due respect. Because to me, the big, big difference between what we do and what we should be doing if we want to get into that space is the time that it takes. And the time that it takes, I mean, even expedited arbitration, even fast track arbitration as we know it, will not take two days, right? And if you want to have a decision process that is fair, that gives a chance to everyone to be heard properly uh, and within that sort of space of time, then some heads need to come together. Uh, it, it can be done. It's just a matter of conceiving the process differently. And I, I, I am afraid that, um, it's great that I think that institutions such as JAMS are, 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 are making this, these initiatives, but unless they can compress the time and come with a new uh, version of uh, online dispute resolution fairness, then I, I think they're wasting their time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can imagine a world where Eduardo and Charlie are putting in their coins to become arbitrators in this blockchain dispute resolution process but I can't imagine them deciding a case based on game theory of which what's the majority most likely to want to, uh, where's the majority most likely to end up? It just seems like an unprincipled basis on which to resolve any serious conflicts. You say that, but don't forget, um, we are talking about a decentralized system. We are talking about users of the blockchain who do not trust the musings of three people or one person chosen by word of mouth or otherwise or imposed by an institution. They trust the judgment of their peers. That's the values that they champion. 
These are people who, for whom likes on Instagram or other social media are worth much more than what central, centralized institutions from the top down tell them to, to do. So when you look at it from that prison, then things start to, not to, I wouldn't say that they make complete sense, but you can see where we need to adjust um, is what I would say. Uh, we, we, we have a question about um, whether it would be feasible to enforce an award that lacks territory, ter territoriality because it's blockchain. blockchain. I mean, in essence, what you're describing for us is like delocalization on steroids here. Um, how it is do exactly we... that. Um, <laughs> the, and that's a great question because it brings to the fore, apart from the New York Convention um, application, it brings to the fore the other great challenge of these decisions is they are enforceable online with online assets. I described before that these assets are virtual and they're worth money. At the moment, these decisions are enforceable, self-enforceable self on the blockchain with assets on the blockchain. How you translate these decisions to enforcement outside, offline, is not something that has been done. Uh, and it's going to be a, a tremendous challenge and something that, that will need to be done at one point. But at the moment, uh, there's enough money on the blockchain uh, to not uh, want to rush to enforcement off chain and, and all the difficulties that this presents. And if you have, you know, uh, plots of land and so on that can be uh, seized and enforced again uh, on chain, then uh, maybe there won't be any need to go off chain. Well, for, for those of us legacy international arbitration thinkers who think that even in legacy international arbitration, a seat of arbitration is unnecessary. Um, I think this would come as a, a welcome development. The only issue becomes the enforcement issue. And some of the enforcement would be automated through the blockchain process. And to the extent further enforcement is required, you go to traditional means of enforcement via national courts. But it is one further step uh, towards the delocalization of dispute resolution. And it's um, it's food for thought. Uh, I, I think we have a time for one last question here. Um, do you think that a court may set aside a decentralized award since there may be a party's right to know who their arbitrator is? Um, so, to my knowledge, and, and I uh, certainly under the New York Convention, that's not the standard. The standard is that a party has a, a right to know that an arbitral tribunal has been appointed uh, and in accordance with the arbitration clause. But uh, parties that agree to, to, to systems like Claros, for example, uh, you know, we're not talking about consumer arbitration here. We're talking about people who essentially are aware of, of, of how it works. Uh, once That's what going to be one challenge that they're going to face uh, if, they, if they go mainstream. But at the moment, that's not what's going on. They know exactly how it works. They know that it's random peers on the blockchain who uh, have no qualification other than their knowledge of, of, of the ecosystem and how it works. And so uh, I don't think that this is uh, the sort of, of query that is that is likely to arise, certainly as the system goes at the moment. Thank you. Um, I want to, our, our, our time is up here. Um, I do want to um, thank so much our panelists um, for addressing these kind of current technological issues with respect to remote hearings and um, th this eye-opening talk about smart contracts and blockchain dispute resolution. Um, it will be very interesting to see you again, Sophie, next year at Columbia Arbitration Day and see where we are um, in this progression. But until then, I want to thank you all. Thank you very much.